Welcome to Film for Thought, a film podcast by film students for film students. My name is Michael Ortizada, and I am your host. Uh, today we have sort of a special episode. Uh, this is uh, clearly a sort of themed episode um, on Spider-Man and Spider-Man in film. And uh, with me today, I have a good friend of mine, a comic book historian, all things Spider-Man, uh, Sergio Andana. I thank you for coming on the podcast, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I've been a big fan. I, I'm a med student. I don't really belong here, but but I, I love Spider-Man. I love the Spider-Man movies. Some of them not so much, but we'll get to that. It's a, um, a long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for <laughs> sure. Um, no, it's, uh, it's nice to have you here, and I definitely wanted to talk about Spider-Man um, because I feel like he's a very good representation in uh, what makes a good archetype like what makes a good character and beyond that what makes a character transcend through time oh yeah spider-man is definitely a, a very timeless character like he's been around since 1962 uh, amazing fantasy 15 and it's 2020 now he's still relevant to this day and i feel like i'll have my my children and my grandchildren will probably end up reading uh, some Spider-Man comics or watching his movies. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I I I completely agree. It's 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 sort of um, when a writer or you know a creator um, makes a sort of project or makes a character like in storytelling, and it's so it it's it's like, and to a point where it's even considered like prophetic in a way because you know and you know kids in 1960 could relate to spider-man and kids today can still relate to sort of the character and the essence the essence et, sorry the essence of what the character is and i mean f from i mean you're the person that i know that has most seen the movies seen like tv shows and like read the comics on spider-man how do you feel like his evolution has gone from you know the page to the screen i feel like there's definitely been some change like I don't think Tobey Maguire is the perfect Spider-Man right off the page. I, lo I love his representation. It is my favorite representation on screen, but he's not entirely comic accurate. But that's another, that's another thing. I don't really value comic accuracy too much. As long as it's Spider-Man, you get the core of the character, which I feel they did in the Raimi movies, then he can have organic webs. That's not in the comics, but he can have organic webs. He can yeah, be a little it's, different. It's still, I mean, it's, and, and there's like, you know, room and change indefinitely. Um, but, you know, it's still, it's still hitting on the points and it's still like, I feel like it's, it's changed over time, even from Tobey Maguire or the 70s adaptation to uh, Tom Holland's interpretation of the character. There's There's been a lot of, of, you know, like slight fluctuation, but, you know, it's still that same essence of, you know, character who's, who's um you know, went from being kind of in, insignificant and went from being, um, I don't want to say detached from society, but just um, shunned from society in a way and then just grown you know haven't given this uh you know power and then just using it for good and using it for you know person for and like you know the line of great power comes great responsibilities exactly. an iconic line and you know it's it's and it's um uh, applicable to anything true and and it's applicable to the essence and the what this character represents as a whole and uh why he does what he does and why he constantly goes over and over and sacrifices things like you know in, and and this is you could agree or disagree in any interpretation of spider-man but you know to the essence of what makes uh an interpretation good i feel like you can see that with each character and toby mcguire's interpretation you know he has to decide between mj and 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 whatnot in in um in andrew garfield's he had to do something um, um well, yeah, i'm not save the, the city it's, um, it, he's saving the city. turning from turning people into lizards um uh, lizard something he killed some, electro killed a dad okay um <laughs> jamie fox's teeth gap got fixed okay. by electric we'll, eels we'll get into, uh, an, into that was weird. andrew garfield's uh interpretation nothing against andrew garfield by the way he, oh no not at all he's a i love him as spider-man i feel like he's one of my favorite spider-mans like in general i loved his interpretation of it but um there was just a lot of problems with uh, the product the final it is product. it is flawed 
it is it it does have its uh little niches but... and there there is a small twitter uh hashtag release the web cut kind of like a smaller version of release the snyder cut <sighs> but yeah you know but um i mean beyond that there's still there's still a, an essence to to what the character is and i feel like you know they, they all strive for you know sacrifice and strive for good and i mean do you have a preference i mean since like you know the the knowledge you have of the character do you have a a preference of how the character is written or how the character is like represented um through like you know the comics or the tv shows or like what do you feel like has been like most accurate representation so most accurate um i'm really into spectacular spider-man like and ultimate spider-man as well but if we're talking about main universe spider-man uh then I think spectacular is the way to go. Like As one of the, the animated TV show. The, man, the animated TV show, yeah. Sorry, in case you didn't know. Uh, but like in the Tobey Maguire version, Peter is kind of depicted as this dopey kid, which I love and I kind of relate to. Honestly, you know me. I'm, I am kind of. <laughs> uh, but spectacular Spider Man does give him that edge where Peter Parker is kind of an angry kid, and he he has an attitude. Uh, which is something that was represented by Andrew Garfield, but you definitely see that in um, Josh Keaton's performance in Spectacular Spider-Man. Uh, and, you know, they deal with a lot of Spider-Man stories in, like, classic Spider-Man stories in more modern settings. And honestly, I do feel like Spider-Man works very well serialized. I love the movies, but he does work very well in in a in a in a serialized uh, format. Yeah, I've definitely thought that the best representation of um, any animated or any comic book medium has been you know transition into animation. Which I think it's funny how I mean in Japan in regards to that, like how manga is just like thrown into anime. It's not the same thing in the West Western no, Hemisphere, no. which I think is so interesting. Because there's, you know, a, a very big divide of when it comes to animation and then, you know, comic books. It's always different. Like, Harley Quinn's comic books are really different to Harley Quinn's TV show. Um, Spider-Man's comic books are really different to its its um, its component in animation or, I mean, also in, 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 in film. But, um, I mean, getting, getting back into the character and um, why it's so essential, it's um you know the the character spider-man i feel like uh has a lot to to show and it's and and if it's written correctly and and you can see that beyond uh being written by different characters or i'm sorry being written by different authors and uh like taken over and over again as long as like there's a common understanding of who this character is and what these characters values are like from you know superior spider-man all the way to you know the 1960s there's still like a common essence obviously you know some change like from time to time and and that's true also for the movies um i mean with like toby Maguire's interpretations to tom holland but there's still a common denominator of you know that sort of underdog character and always having to sacrifice more and more and more for good actually i was gonna say now that you bring up superior spider-man how different people have taken up the mantle and like even what it means to be spider-man has been uh so i I feel like the character of spider-man has been deconstructed in a way that it's been taken beyond who peter parker is and it's exploring more what does it mean to be spider-man and that is something that is explored in uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, as as we have right here with uh, my boy Miles Morales. Uh, like, uh, all these different people, half of them are Peter Parker in the movie, but, you know, we focus on Miles, who is not Peter Parker, yet he is Spider-Man. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that, um, it's, it's, it's become very integral, um, to I mean just the role of Spider Man, no matter like the character like Peter Parker or Miles Morales, it's still you know like the mantle and like what it represents because it, it, eventually it still it still means like Miles Morales is just the more more recent incarnation of it and Tom Holland's performance and Tom like the the story of Spider Man now in the MCU reflects more the story of Miles Morales than it does actual Peter Parker in a way. I mean, 
if well, you yeah. if you if yeah. you if you get in and read the source material and then go back and watch like you do the find MCU lots movies, of parallels. there are a lot more parallels than you would have thought. Ned Leeds true. is literally Genki, Miles's best friend from the comics. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, it's, it's um, and there's other similarities. Yeah, there's a lot. There's definitely a lot of similarities, but um, I feel like in the MCU. It's uh in the MCU movie in the MCU Spider-Man movies they focus a lot on Peter having to earn the title of being a hero, uh and I don't feel like I feel like that's more Miles Morales exactly. because, like, it, that, because that Miles was Morales something I, I wanted to get into too it's because because Miles Morales has to uh because a lot of uh, Miles' story is proving that hey I'm Spider-Man too uh I am Spider-Man uh, whereas Peter's just you know, with great power comes great responsibility. He has to keep sacrificing even when the world beats him down, like constantly. Yeah, and it's and it's, but it, and what I what I wanted to go to is you know even even if it's if if it's this interpretation or if it's if it's this one, it's still the mantle of Spider Man and what it represents. Yeah. I mean, one has to sort of you know pick up a mantle, and the other one is just trying to do good. But at the same time, it's still. It's still, you know, an essence of, uh, you know, sacrificing and just have to keep moving on with um, what they do. And I feel like this is something that's not touched on enough. But um, since we were watching an animated TV show, I, I, I realize that, um, you know, the character is just it's always put in a specific place where he's against a wall. It's always, you know, yeah. sacrificing you know, time, friends, an individual life, and 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 then have to be like, and you know, I gotta fight the good fight. I gotta, I gotta do something else. I'm I'm helping people. I'm, I'm I'm trying to achieve something bigger than just you know myself as yeah, a person. One of the big things I liked about uh the Raimi trilogy and Spectacular Spider-Man the animated series was Peter. I mean, sure, he'll have fun being Spider-Man, but. More often than not, he does not like being Spider-Man. Uh, one of the big episodes of the first season of Spectacular Spider-Man was when Peter had um, a sort of chemical that was able to take away his powers. And at the end of the episode, his life was his his life was going through a rough patch. Like Aunt May didn't let him go out late. Everyone thought that he was scum. Like his friends didn't like him anymore. And he said, "This is all Spider-Man's fault. Uh, maybe we, we'd be better off without him." But then. He he sees, he sees a picture of Uncle Ben, which, you know, is a little on the nose, but still. And he says, no, I'll get rid of Spider-Man when the world doesn't need him anymore. Like, he he puts everyone above himself. Yeah, uh, and it's and it's something, like, also that, you know, like, the, you, you can't really talk about because, you know, you have to... It's, it, it's very secret to him. Like, you know, it's like, I feel like here is where he... They really solidified, you know, the alternate personality or like the sorry the alter ego of you know spider-man and peter parker and it's like having that divide of like i i fight crime i do all these things but then i go back home and then i'm and i have to deal with the consequences of like putting everybody uh everybody before myself and i feel like this is like the, the reason why i wanted to make an episode surround about this character is because even if the the reason why interpretations of this character are good, even if they're bad, is because the essential, the essentiality of this character is sacrifice. And I feel like when it comes to storytelling, that's something that a lot of people forget, that um, you have to put characters in a place where you have to make them sacrifice something more than the other. And I feel like nothing can be more apparent than in Spider-Man and how this is done. Like in, in, in all the movies, you know. There is always sacrifice, and that's, I think that's part of what makes the character so. Well, there are characters that that do have to sacrifice. I mean, there's always sacrifice in in a in a in a hero's story, but Peter Parker's sacrifice is very human, and I feel there is some. I feel like there's some overlap from what I've seen between Spider-Man fans and Batman fans because the appeal of both of these characters is that they're human. Peter Parker is not. A, a rich kid like, like Iron Man. He's not a, a a war hero like Captain America. He's just a kid from Queens, uh, and I, I'd say he's even more human than than Batman because Batman. I mean, I I yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Uh, I, <laughs> even with the superpowers, I feel like he's more human than than Batman. I I definitely agree with that. He's like you know he's like the everyman's hero. He's you know he he was a person that had 
he has human problems and in every iteration like he has that like he's most of the issues he has to deal with would come to like holding his person uh his uh, uh secret identity it, are human you know like putting his friends aside putting um you know people in his in his life as peter parker aside in order to go out and um you know fight for what's fight right and, and just fight crime in general and um and like the the character does so so well in and in, in i feel like in every medium if it's animation if it's uh you know film or whatnot and to a point where um it can even i don't know transcend in a way because i feel like that i mean like getting more into detail with uh spider-man to spider-verse like that movie wasn't only monumental for its storytelling but also what it for what it did for animation and i after watching that movie i can't remember believing a movie i like i i I left the movie theater and my jaw dropped oh of course like i I, and i then i recalled i was like i can't remember the last time that 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 happened i walked out of a movie theater like like just jaw dropped no what just happened like something completely insane i've never had a movie experience like that and and it it barely diminishes with each time I rewatch it. I've I've watched that movie like five times. Uh, I've seen the alternate universe cut where they added some deleted scenes. Uh, I think the only thing I'm missing to watch is the director's commentary. And and each and every time I I love it. The I watch the director's commentary and it's 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 I really liked it honestly just because it's um and they really went into depth on describing how the the process of you know like meshing um mediums yeah Yeah, like like, but um the way that they like sort of invented new ways to you know give it more of a comic comic booky aspect and um you know like it's you know the character in itself is a pillar to storytelling and i do feel like it's gonna outlive us all in a way just because it's how you know how ingrained it is in society and how essential it is for storytelling yeah like can can you can you name a single person that you know th- can you name a single person that you know who doesn't who can't immediately recognize spider-man yeah, yeah and it's and, and, it, and, it, and it and it just the, the irony, irony that it went from, from a, a you know a comic book that was about to get like taken, taken down, down from the shelves yeah amazing to amazing a, fantasy 15 a multi-billion dollar industry just, just like that, that. Well, I wanted to get back into the topic of uh, talking about Sam Raimi's movies. Yeah, let's get into the actual. Let's get, <laughs> let's into, get the actual into the movies. actual meat of this. Um, I mean, in regards to, I know it. He had a kind of an unorthodox approach, I might say. <laughs> well, because I think- it, it, I mean, he, he, the character that he created is, I mean, it's definitely Peter Parker, but um, he definitely changed a lot of things. I think he made the character like dorkier like dope yeah he was he was very dopey but i feel like there was a lot more freedom back then because there weren't a lot of at least not a, not a lot of good superhero movies like it was sam raimi spider-man x-men and uh i think blade is another famous one no and, yeah, but, and batman of course the dark knight yeah it was around that time right um a little bit later if i'm not yeah a little bit later because the these ones were originally released or the second one was released in like 2002 i think about that uh, early 2000s but yeah. um batman's like the dark knight trilogy from christopher nolan was um like later on in the 2000s but um i feel like sam raimi isn't given the credit he's due for the mcu oh for sure like there would be no mcu without without these movies that we just mentioned yeah like they they definitely sort of superhero movies before that were were seen as like you didn't want to do a superhero movie like even even in the industry of film where everything is kind of like risky for it's it's already risky and then like before sam like a sam raimi they were just they were just like like (laughs) superhero movies were just considered like like i don't know do we want to do that do we really want to go and do this i don't know if this is like a lucrative field and it's like yeah. it goes from that to what like 20 yeah and then 19 now if you it's like the highest grossing now movie if you don't do a superhero movie nobody cares because like yeah like you won't get money this is a the, superhero film this is the era of superhero movies and it's and it's insane that um I feel like Sam Raimi doesn't give enough, get enough recognition for this. Uh, and um, I do feel like 
he his interpretation of S- Spider Man and all and also the villains. Yeah, I feel like the villain. I mean the end. The end of the first the first movie was really cheesy. <laughs> I, but the whole movie was cheesy, but the whole, I, I, the lo- whole movie I, lo- I was, loved it. The I whole movie it. was cheesy, and I did I enjoyed these movies thoroughly. But I mean, the second movie with you know like Doc Doctor yeah. Octavius and uh, who who was the guy the actor uh, Alfred Molina Alfred Alfred Molina I'm pretty sure Alfred yeah the actor for Doc Ock that's yeah, Alfred, Alfred Molina. Molina that's Alfred, Alfred Molina. Molina and it's like I'm pretty sure he's Mexican too if I'm not if I'm not mistaken I don't know um but like his because I, I mean, his interpretation of Doc Ock was, I feel like, oh, it's one f- of the strongest representations of villains and like giving a character depth who's an antagonist, like in this. I like I, I just like remember vividly because you had like you know the person of like who like uh, like Otto Octavius and then you had like Doc like and then you had like Doctor Octopus yeah which is really the tentacles of, yeah it's, it's really the tentacles like, but messing um, with his mind and it's and it's and it's sort of um I, I don't know like I I always thought the second one to be like one of the most impactful like superhero movies I've seen yes of course just because like the and because I I feel like Sam Raimi did this on purpose that. The real superhero in that movie isn't. It was sort of yeah. Alfred. Or it was. It was Oc- Otto, Otto Octavius. Octavius like, Otto Octavius died a hero. Like he died a hero. Like, like I love. I love that line. Movie. Like his last line. I will not die a monster. It. It it sent chills down down my back. Uh, oh, by the way, he's uh, he's from the UK, so he, that that is UK? not Mexico. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, I, because I he was in the the Frida Kahlo movie. Oh, uh, yeah, and he uh, speaks like fluent Spanish too. But yeah, and Otto Octavius, I, I I don't think it's a hot take to say that he's widely regarded as one of the best, if not the best, uh, supervillain depicted on screen. Um, yeah, absolutely. honestly, honestly, if you ask me, I, I personally mean, like, prefer the first movie, but I see that I I I acknowledge that the second movie is probably the most impactful one. Like when it comes to supervillains in in com- in like you know like comic book based movies. Like you think Heath Ledger or or now like Joaquin Phoenix, but you know what? Alfred Molina isn't given enough. I feel like enough. He's up there. I mean, he's definitely up there because his interpretation of a villain, like his motives were like righteous, and he was like a good person, and then he ended up dying. You know, he was more like an anti-villain than an actual villain in that way, mm-hmm. just because of you know what transpired and he was just there for a movie too but a lot a lot of it is his pride because he i I remember in the movie there was this whole experiment about the his his generator right the the machine he was making and and peter had asked him like he was concerned he said if you make the slightest miscalculation the city will blow up and he said nah man i've i've been i've been up countless nights just uh, running these calculations again and again and then it blew up in his face and then when he actually became doc ock he said no actually i my calculations could not have been wrong i'll do it again and that's that's him being prideful and just um and and using science for 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 evil even if he didn't really intend it and i feel like the i mean the more modern the more like um formal formulaic uh superhero movies that have come come and gone um i won't name anything or like i mean i'd say like green lantern or something like that but it's um you know that they're like these movies are profitable but they don't go ahead and create a solid you know like maybe they go ahead and create a solid lead and create a like a solid protagonist because that's what the movie's based on but having an equally good antagonist is like so essential and that's why spider-man 2 stands out so heavily and that's why you know heath ledger was like regarded like as he was regarded as the the character of the joker yeah i can probably count like on one hand maybe two maybe two if i try real hard to count the 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 amount of of memorable villains in the mcu or even uh the dc movie (laughs) It's so, yeah, like, do probably. you really remember Umamo from <laughs> Doctor Strange? Uma- oh, um, Dormammu. Dormammu. I, I remember be- him for the meme. <laughs> like, I remember him from the meme, the meme too. But like, 
There's there's nothing really that it's it's just a, a and I'm not big gonna shit on Doctor face. Strange because nice. also Sam Raimi's about to direct the second Doctor Strange movie. Yeah, uh, which um I am so sad that there's not gonna be an R rated version of that. <laughs> but um, I think the best the, I think the one of, one of the funniest memes that's come out of uh the fact that Sam Raimi is directing Doctor Strange is how people praise Sam Raimi for for going the extra mile and doing practical effects as, as much as he can. And people are saying Sam Raimi will create dimensional, like uh, multidimensional transportation. He will do it all practical. He will do it actually. He was going <laughs> to go into the multiverse. He is actually going to open a rift in space time. But, um, you know, like it's, it's funny because then you go from, you know, Sam Raimi's movies that are you know, are not, like, cult classics. They're, like, you know, I feel like they're, in a way that they're not even, like, considered, like, Spider-Man, not, they're not considered, like, the average, um, you know, like, story for superheroes, or, like, the superhero movies that are now, like, created and known, because those are, like, he, enormous, like, ungodly budgets, ungodly people, like, yeah. working on it in, like, sets that are just, like, full full on enterprises just for that one like you know movie and one product and then it's like and it was like sam raimi just he was just given the opportunity to do that and then moving from you know the early 2000s to the 2010s when andrew garfield was um spider-man it's like and then the and then studios were like my god making superhero movies is incredibly lucrative what if we uh, did it, it again? Did and it again, again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And um, uh, but um, getting into that, and um, I do want to hear your thoughts on uh, what do you think of the Amazing Spider-Man? The Amazing Spider-Man and both of those movies. So I think we all know. Well, I say we all know, but I know. I don't know how. I don't know. We're I don't know what the can royal, be considered the royal we. <laughs> I don't know what can be considered common knowledge uh, because a lot of stuff that people don't know is common knowledge to me. But I think a good amount of people know that Andrew Garfield was robbed and Mark Webb was robbed of his vision. Uh, like Andrew Garfield has publicly said that the studio kind of ruined the movies. Uh, yeah, and a particular I, man I, I do has feel... been put at fault for that. I remember watching an interview not so long ago of Andrew Dar- Garfield, like, talking about this. He was being interviewed for another movie or something else. But, and then, and he, got, he got choked up, too, because he, he, like, he clearly looked like he was somebody who really enjoyed the character and then was dealt a shit hand. He is as much a fan as you and me. Yeah, and I do, and it, it, it really does break my heart, like, to see, like, um, you know, like, being associated to you know like being able to be associated to the character you love so dear but in a negative connotation yeah. which is you know like it's such a it's such a it's a, it, it can be like such emotional tor- turmoil like, for if, him if and i were I, given the chance to get in the suit and be in the movie and then it turns out that it's bad that it that it gets compromised that it's not a good spider-man story i would be devastated yeah and i and i can and i can see how that caused like caused him a lot of grief but at the same time, he that there, there were still moments in even in both of those movies where you you could see his acting like shine through. Oh yeah, like and in both of the movies, you could. I definitely did see. like his acting interpretation of Spider Man, even if it's you know like if it, it just in in regards to his individual experience as an actor mm-hmm. with the character and being able to interpret the character, I feel like he did great. And I, 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 I understand the difficulties presented from the studio, from, you know, the writers and just like, you know, like everybody being down like the, the creatives throats just in order to get like the product out there and be able to, you know, sell. I would say that the scene on the bridge, I'm pretty sure you know which one I'm talking about. Uh, when the lizard's wreaking havoc and Spider-Man has to go in and save a bunch of people because he's throwing cars off the bridge. I would say... I would go so far as to say that is better than uh, a lot of Sam Raimi stuff. Like that, that scene is is up there with one Absolutely. of the best scenes and it's, in all of Spider-Man media. And most people forget that um, Mark Webb directed both of the Amazing Spider-Man movies. Right? Yes, yes, he did. And it's like Mark Webb is an amazing director. Like he directed Five Hundred Days of Summer, and that movie is regarded as 
in you know an amazing fleet of storytelling and it's just like an actual like an actual like story of love and and what it is and you know like he 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 has such a grasp of human emotion and being able to exude that through you know an audiovisual medium mm-hmm. and i feel like that specific scene with um you know peter giving saving that kid and giving it to his father really is reminiscent reminiscent of um sort of what the character of peter parker has to sacrifice and he like clearly understands um the character and, and you know what it means and what it represents but um but nonetheless they were but that's given like very very shit hand and i do feel sorry for them um and it's before maybe not knowing enough of what happened i did shit a lot and <laughs> thinking about it on yeah. andrew garfield i think we all did. and yeah and on mark unfairly Webb. so but you there you you have to remember that you know it's it was the studio now everybody knows that it was a studio that actually did it and it, they weren't really them you know it was stuff that they were forced to do yeah and it was be, looking like above their pay grade and looking at spider-verse i'm i'm hoping that I, it looks like sony's learned their lesson because but you have to remember also i mean into the spider-verse the animated movie right here yeah um that is a different facility than you know sony pictures sony sony pictures sony animation and sony pictures are two different things that's Uh, why the exec producer um who i always forget the name of avi arad avi arad um he was still an executive uh, producer here if i'm not mistaken um he's probably higher up in that regard but also i mean he clearly doesn't understand like from what we've seen him do and how we know he's manipulated these movies. He clearly doesn't know the character as well. So he probably more invested on like live action on screen than this. Yeah. And that's why this got, that's why I'm also really scared for the second one because really? they're like, this movie's incredibly profitable and Avi Rod's going to probably get this. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Avi Rod was the man responsible for Venom in Spider-Man three. Uh, Sam Raimi has gone on record saying multiple times saying like he doesn't he doesn't like the character of Venom uh but you know Venom sells toys so that's that and uh he also wanted I think I feel like no I feel like that's just Avi Rod not understanding the character because like they don't get any money from toys and that's why they're so that's why it no. It's such a legal battle for the rights on screen of of oh, Spider Man right. because the people that actually make the toys and make the money from the toys that's Disney, right? It's Disney, and Sony doesn't make a dime from that. True, I could be mistaken, but from my understanding, that is how it works. But still, Avi Arad loves Venom, and just and any and he said the same Raimi. He he forced him to to put Venom in the movie, which was supposed to be ah uh, I. I really don't like thinking about the the production of Spider Man Three. I like the movie. I still think it's enjoyable dis- despite its several flaws. But several, I, I, several, flaws. several, several. But it's it's still an enjoyable movie. But I don't like thinking about the production because in the first minutes of the movie, you can still see what it was supposed to be—a story about Peter Parker succumbing to to the sin of pride. Like this is a it, the story begins with Peter saying that, that with with Peter saying and being shown being loved by all of New York as Spider-Man and New York oftentimes kind of doesn't like Spider-Man. Yeah. It, and it's really just like it, they do or they don't. But um, I mean, and in those movies and in the, uh, the amazing Spider-Man movies, you can clearly see how the studio like, manipulated heavily and you know they were like what if we make a little dubstep scene in amazing yeah. spider-man the amazing 2 spider-man like 2, fighting oh. and it sounds all like hip and cool like the kids like it a big thing about the amazing spider-man 2 is it's just a setup for the sinister six it really was just a setup for because we got six. rhino we got rhino was there for no reason uh electro uh and the green goblin out of nowhere Oh yeah, that was really awkward. Did did you did you forget the Green Goblin was? No, I remember, but uh, it was it was just a really that movie. It was in the last five the seconds. Mo- the movie the movie was just really odd, and I didn't enjoy it um, as much as I probably wanted to. And um, I did. I just I just feel bad knowing that uh, me uh, like being a kid 
watching that movie and being like, this is garbage. <laughs> Fuck Andrew Garfield. What did, <laughs> I, he, what did he do? Oh, man. You want to hear, hear a story about when I found out Andrew Garfield, like they were rebooting Spider-Man? Even as a kid, I was I was a huge fan of, of Spider-Man and the Sam Raimi movies. I remember once I don't I didn't read the newspaper as a kid, but one morning I woke up uh, and like I don't I, when, when was it announced that it was getting a reboot like 2011, 2010? Reboot for Andrew for, Garfield. For, uh, like they were uh, rebooting the Spider-Man Raimi films and making them the the Mark Webb films with Andrew Garfield. Oh, 2012, 2013, 2012, I think. Around that time, I didn't I didn't read the newspaper. I was just a kid. Uh, but one morning I woke up and I saw a newspaper on on the on the kitchen counter with a picture of some guy dressed up in a in a Spider-Man outfit, and I said, "Oh, the, this caught my eye." So I pick up the newspaper and it says, um, "Yeah, like 2011, 2010." Yeah, so 2011, and I pick up the newspaper and it says that there's that Sony's rebooting the Spider-Man movies, and I asked my mom like, "What what does this mean?" And she says, "Oh." I, the, um, they're they're going with a new actor, and I say, well, is there still going to be a Spider-Man four? And she said, no, they're starting over. And that was that was a very sad day for me. I which you know now I know better, but it still is is pretty sad for me. Yeah, yeah. I just I feel like that movie that movie looked really nice. Those movies looked really nice. Yes, but. I feel like they if were If you ignore like, Lizard, they look really nice. Yeah, and bef- yeah, besides the Lizard. But like they <laughs> they the movie looks really nice and both of them do. Both of them are like very bright and colorful and they look pretty. But I feel like they opted more towards we're going to make Spider-Man look like Spider-Man, not let's develop the character and then like he evolves with the position and whatnot. It's it, it was it was it really felt more like a marketing ploy and just to make it look pretty. I feel like that's than more the case. Develop the I feel story. Like that's, I feel like that's more the case with the Amazing Spider-Man two because with the Amazing Spider-Man one, I, I yeah yeah I, I, I still I, I I definitely because they clearly had less manipulation for the first one yeah. than the second one. Um, but um, it's it's like. I don't know. I really don't fuck with the goggles and the costume like for the second movie. Yeah, uh, the the lenses. The I feel like they're way too big. I like the big lenses, but they, that's just me. They look just so cosplay. <laughs> just they look straight up like yeah. Andrew Garfield's against... Andrew Garfield's just motherfucking doing cosplay. You got something against? I don't cosplay? have anything against <laughs> cosplay, but if it's a multi million dollar production yeah. with just an insane amount of people <laughs> working on it, I imagine that they're gonna do something different or like something like cool and new instead yeah. of just like halloween party this the halloween party he looks like a cosplay you can no, be but him I, I i love the suit uh in the amazing spider-man 2 i i, I prefer the first one just because it felt more you have a problem with those oakley's i yes i do have a problem with those Oakleys. you have a problem uh, with those oakley's on the suit and i don't have a problem with those oakley's just because it, it felt it felt it definitely felt like you could see how smart the character was, and you could see, like, even that monster sequence of him. Oh developing yeah, the the the, suit the, the creation scene, the suit creation scene was definitely uh, a really good scene in in the first uh, Amazing Spider-Man movie. But the thing is, uh, like, I, I really like, I really like to see um, him make the suit because oh, it's in, great. It's like. It, because in, in, in the Sam Raimi trilogy... You see draw, and that's nice, it, it, but... Oh, yeah, but it, and it's nice and all, but, like, you... It, it goes from that... I can see It goes that. from drawing to actually having the suit, and it's, like... And it's, like... And, and it's and it's not, like, a simple suit, either. No, like it's Sam very Raimi's elaborate. Like, Sam like, super elaborate, and I was, like, you a master stitcher, what the fuck? Raised, <laughs> raised webbing, which I love, by the way. I... I my, the Sam Raimi... Sam, I, Sam Raimi costume is my favorite costume so far. And yeah. It's like, I love that costume to death. But at the same time, that motherfucker could not have made it. He is way too dopey looking to be a master... <laughs> this uh, man. Stitcher or whatnot. Like, so... Yeah, but the thing about the, the... I... By the way, don't go on Spider-Man Twitter... They will eat you alive. It's it's a it's a cesspool of just degeneracy and <laughs> bad takes. But I do partake in <laughs> Spider Man Twitter, and people seem to like the first Amazing Spider Man suit. And I, I can't get around those lenses. I don't like them. I can't get around the second I'm, one. They're just too big. I'm a fan of 
big round uh, <laughs> white lenses. So don't, don't take this. Don't take this out of context. Like the comic books. Like the comic books. No, but I I still like. But like it's, the, it's the, the more slanted when you, lenses when you have a comic and a comic book and then you're trying to interpret it. It's the same thing. It's the same principle when you have a novel and you're trying to make it into a film. Yes, of there's course. some things that you have to change in order to be visual, like visually pleasing, and there is a different type of visual pleasure from seeing something like this. Right now, I'm pointing at some of the um. <laughs> some of the like displays we have here of like Spider-Man in costume in comics and then having that to for example like the 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 sort of shape that um Toby Maguire has on his suit mm -hmm. which is like just like you know like the straight shot the, up. the angry lenses the angry lenses if you will yes but um i i understand the reason they went for the Oakleys i'm just i do feel like in in a that this is why i I kind of, I do, I didn't like the fact of what they did in the MCU with like Spider-Man, uh, right. Spider and giving him, you know, the suit and whatnot. A lot of people don't like that. I don't like that. Um, but at the same time, it was. <laughs> it does make sense though. It makes sense because it doesn't make sense in Sam Raimi that a Tobey Maguire or like Spider-Man was just a master sewer and yeah. then just was able to make this like incredible suit just like that after making what like three sketches i don't i don't take too much issue with uh with the mcu suit being given to him by tony stark because he has a fantastic homemade suit like the 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 homemade suit in the mcu is my favorite home homemade suit yeah it's it and it's a it's a relatively good homemade suit and i feel like they they gave him like a good leeway of like no, this is something that a kid who is like brilliant could actually make. Yes, of course. In the way, like in in regards to like budget and like you know the eyes and the lenses and stuff. Oh, like that's that, fantastic. Which is like, it's cool, but it's not outlandish. Which is what they were going yeah. for. Like Sam Raimi and like uh, Peter Parker making the, that suit. That's outlandish. <laughs> Even it you is, know for for what it is. And, even um, in the world of Sam Raimi. Even even in the world of Sam Raimi, but <laughs> like going back into it, it it does make sense, and I do like. Even though I don't really, I don't know how I feel about like, Iron Man giving him the suit, but I do I do like that suit, like the first like actual Spider Man suit that they had in the MCU. I don't I don't mind that Iron Man gave him the suit. It's because it's, as you said, it's. It's a very well made suit, and he couldn't he could not have done that. He he couldn't have done that. But what I do take issue with is is pretty much everything else that has has to do with uh, Spider Man and Iron Man in the MCU movies. Spider Man should not have an AI. Spider Man should not have like five hundred twenty seven combinations of of, of web, uh, including a uh, an instant kill one no, given he to not him. Have just Man given not to have him, just like that. Not even. Doesn't even have a car, and I was like, "Here's an absolutely." <laughs> he does not know how to drive. This is uh more dangerous than a loaded gun, <laughs> and we are giving it to this boy. I think Tony really wants to get Peter to kill because first it's the instant kill mode in the suit, and then in Far From Home he gives him Edith, which is just a weapon of mass destruction. It really is just a weapon of mass, which destruction. is surprising because <clears throat> sorry, which is surprising because part of Tony's arc was not making weapons anymore. And, and I, here he is making weapons. And uh, I feel like this is a good segue from uh, Mark Webb's movies into the Russo's oh, yeah, we're, and we're into already, the MCU. We're already into this. And um, I, well, we're already into this. And uh, this is why I have a poster behind me, right above me. Of he did this despite <laughs> me. Right above me of uh, Iron Man, and uh, I did it despite you, and to talk he, about he did how despite me. Do you feel, but do you feel like the character is sort of stunted or affected because of Iron Man's presence in the MCU? Yes, yes, I I, I do feel this way. Uh, all right, all I right. still yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Homecoming, but Far From Home kind of ruins some of the stuff Homecoming does because I'll I'll give you an example. Take Homecoming's Vulture, right? It's to me. It's the best MCU villain ever, and it's up there with one with some of the best Spider-Man villains in in movies. I I don't think that's a hot take, uh. But 
And, no, and I agree. I agree. Michael Keaton did a great job oh, as, as the vulture. Uh, and then you have Far From Home's Mysterio, who has a fantastic costume, classic fishbowl head and everything. Um, they're both motivated by Tony Stark, but it so with Vulture, it wasn't a pattern. It was just, oh, I got I got screwed over by rich people, and one of them happens to be Tony Stark, who is like his main target. And, and then I feel I feel like the the reason is, and I feel like your major major issue is that this feels more like a Miles Morales thing, and Iron Man really feels like Peter Parker in this thing, because. Iron yes. Man, Iron Man was the hero. He was just doing it because he wanted to be a hero. Wait, yeah, just let me finish with this real quick. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's just you can't get me to you can't get me started with the MCU and then just not let me finish. All right, but go off, so Vulture had a legitimate grievance with Tony Stark, and it's like okay, whatever. It's 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 just one movie. But then you get Far From Home, and Mysterio's motivation is he named my life's work. He named my life's work Barf, and it's like okay. Okay, man. Nothing now this now Jake this Jake Gyllenhaal though. I feel like Okay, it's Jake Gyllenhaal. I I loved his performance other and I loved the character of Mysterio other than I his motivation. I feel like it was just written poorly, but he he did a good job yes, of what but, he had to work. But now with. it's a pattern. Now 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 it's established as a pattern where every villain in the MCU, every Spider-Man villain in the MCU is an Iron Man villain. They 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 have a grievance with Iron Man. And that's what I disagree with. Uh, now we were talking about how this is a Miles Morales story. He is, he just he just feels like an arbiter for Iron Man, or like a new version of. Yeah. Uh, and this this leads very well into my least favorite scene in probably any Spider Man related media ever. Uh, the airplane scene where uh, in Far From Home, where he Peter vents his frustrations at Happy. He says, "People expect me to be the next Iron Man." And then Happy says, like, you don't have to be the next Iron Man. No one can be the next Iron Man. Just be Spider-Man. And I was like, all right, that's a neat message. But we already learned that in Homecoming, whatever. And then Peter says, okay, I need a new suit. And he goes, he proceeds to make his new suit using Stark technology with, like, waving his hands at holograms exactly the way Tony Stark did. And Happy played ACDC's Back in Black in the background, uh, which is basically Tony Stark's anthem in the mcu and that culminates in this talking more about the mcu um i know you have a very big disdain towards sort of the you know the interpretation and i and i i, I do understand it's not my um favorite storyline since um i don't know the the iron man in the the spider-man stories are like so intertwined which uh does cause a lot of grief for me personally too just because i feel like the character is being like put in just somebody's shadow like that yeah and um and even after they like dealt with it um quotation marks air quotes um i don't feel like they did tony stark is not in far from home yet he kind of is yeah it's it it was like a weird weird thing where they like they're like Oh, he's over it. But, but is really. he though? Is he? Like, is he? But one of the biggest defenses that people have for the Tony Peter relationship in the MCU is they'll say, "No, but actually, and it's it's true. If you think about it, in Homecoming, uh, Tony in in the MCU movies, Tony doesn't really teach Peter anything. He's there and he is sort of a mentor figure, but he doesn't teach him anything, or Peter disobeys him, or just doesn't do what Tony says. However, like. Peter should not be someone's sidekick that people praise for being more independent. He should just already be an independent hero. Yeah, I mean, he was doing hero work before that. And now exactly. he is definitely at a larger scale. But um, this goes back to sort of how the modern day interpretation of Spider-Man is Miles Morales. Because this story feels a lot more like a Miles Morales story than it does a Peter Parker story. Just yes. because... Miles Morales had to fight for his right to be considered a, a hero. And yeah, like, to be considered like, you know, like I I <clears throat> am Spider-Man too. Like I like I am not in the in the shadow of the original one. I am Spider-Man and I came here and I 
and like he fights the fight to be respected yeah to be and pretty much pretty there. much every miles morales story you read uh villains will be like huh what are you some kind of spider-man jr he's like no i'm also spider-man yeah, and he and he has that. And like, there and there are stories where Miles is more independent once he's already like earned the mantle. I would say that in the main universe, he is an already like an established Spider-Man that gets respect of his peers and his villains. But but still, this does feel like sort of early Miles Morales stories to me. Yeah, and it's and it's gonna be um, I don't know interesting to see how it evolves. But I, I just do consider Miles Morales to be the modern day take of Spider-Man. Oh, and I'm here just, for it. Just because, I mean, just how the MCU was put in place, and then they were probably they probably had the same discussion we're having now in regards to how can we adapt a character of Peter Parker into this, or like how can we adapt, adapt Spider Man? And I feel like they wanted to go for sort of a Peter Parker esque, and then have the ability to, I mean, thinking on longevity, they're like, then we add Miles Morales. But I don't think they realize how similar those two stories that they put in place were. Yeah, it's going to be weird when... I say when because it's going to happen. I mean, it's uh, going to happen. It's already when, a multi-billion dollar industry. They got the money to do whatever they want. And and Aaron I mean, Davis did show up in Homecoming, so Miles is a given. Yeah, and um, yeah, played by Childish Gambino, which is like... Or Danny, uh, Donnie Glover, whoa, yeah. which like... I mean, everybody Everybody wanted him to play Miles Morales at one point. Yeah. Like an older version, I guess. No. I don't know. I feel like he would have been a good... Uh, it would have been great. He was Miles he was Morales, Miles Miles no, in Ultimate, right? And I feel like it was kind of cool that they, they made him a yeah, brawler. Yeah, that, was, that, that was, was dope. That was awesome. Um, but but they do have the perfect opportunity now to uh, give to get Miles in the MCU because I mean, of, yeah, they, because they, of the snap. They, they set it up and they're like they have a plan. They clearly have a plan for what they're gonna do. Yeah, because Miles because people were saying no, Miles Miles is probably still a kid in the MCU. Peter's so young right now. Miles must be super young, but it's been five years. Uh, Miles should probably be around that age. Around God, that age this... when it, when a boy becomes a Spider Man. When a boy becomes a Spider Man, but I, it's um in it. it the reason why Far From Home felt really confusing for, on, on my end yeah. is because you really have to wrap your head around, okay, so pe- some people disappeared for the past five years. And I don't think it's like me maybe not understanding the concept. Mm-hmm. Some people disappeared, but everybody grew and then they just came back right yes. after. And then like now the people you knew are like some people that you know that you're younger than you are now older or the same age. Yes. And um, it's just it's just such an odd dynamic. Like every everything just sort of pivots, and like you need to get older characters or some things. There was one character who was who uh, in in Far From Home, Brad Davis, who literally his whole thing was he used to be five years younger, but he didn't get snapped, so he is now the same age as Peter and his friends. Yeah, like that was. And the... it's kind of weird that he has a crush on MJ, like. Would MJ do that with a with a kid that was once five years younger than her? That's that's weird. And I mean, is that ethical? <laughs> and that's then, that's and, a whole and, other thing. That's a, that, and and I was thinking about this too. I was like, what's the what are the ethics of this? Like, are they just considered twenty one years old? Or I mean, Flash couldn't drink in the airplane. Yeah, but like, what are the what what are the rules? I just I need a rule book for this. I feel yeah. like they're they they introduce such a complex like subject to like all this, which I feel like was a big risk. Um, but they 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 had to have like some rules in there. Like uh, like I don't know. Like even morally, it's like I mean, imagine like a kid that was like like what sixth grade and now is like a uh, like a five year different yeah, and now is like it, it, in the sophomore with you. Yeah. Like that's weird. That's really weird. But um, moving along the ethics of the MCU. Let's, let's not. <laughs> let's not. That's a let's, whole can of worms. That is a whole can of worms. I do want to hear your thoughts on um, you know, the interpretation of uh, Miles Morales in uh, uh, uh Spider-Man Into the Spider Verse, uh, since it was you know like I feel like it was a giant fleet for animation and um. You know, and it, it really moved forward animation, like, on for decades. And, like, the it put the bar very high in what film and animation should look like. And I just yes. want to hear your thoughts on the movie. On the day of recording, three days ago was the two-year anniversary of the movie. Um, and that movie, 
a lot of people i feel like a lot of people have described it this way but it cannot be stated enough that this movie was a love letter to spider-man uh from from the representation of of peter parker and then peter b parker to just exploring what it means to be spider-man and not peter parker spider-man um this movie is not only gorgeous it 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 sets up uh, a nice story for miles i love the story of miles in this movie and one of the one I, I love this line that was not included in the actual movie but was played in all the trailers uh and it, it is in one of the deleted scenes where peter b parker is telling miles miles asks like how he can be spider-man how he can be like him but peter says don't do it like me do it like you uh, what makes you different is what makes you spider-man and i love the message of anyone can uh, anyone can wear the mask because what happened to peter parker is a completely random event and yes peter parker did use his powers responsibly he does use his powers to save other people but i love that this movie makes the statement if this ha anyone has the capacity to do that if the spider bit you c could could someone turn evil after getting a, that that spider bite? Yes, but everyone has the capacity to do that good. You don't have to get bitten by a spider to to be a hero. Yeah, and I feel like that's. I feel like these movies, the, this movie, really. I mean, um, put forward the character of Miles Morales, and it was definitely my fair interpretation of the character. I mean, yes. I I I've read practically almost everything in Ultimates. At least that came out like the yeah. the originals that came out until a couple of years ago was pretty well read. And even that, I I I much prefer this uh, you know the audiovisual representation that they mm -hmm. have here, just because they they speak a lot more towards the fact of you know like being the morality aspect of like if you have the ability to do good, will you? And are you going to go forward with this? And you also, and also like a sense of identity that, um, so the character of Miles Morales in general has, and I feel like they really strive towards this um, with like all of the different like Spider-Men and yeah. women and in, the, in, in, the, in, in the movie that um, they all just speak to individuality and like uh, finding your identity. And especially, like, it is a very, um, I feel like it's the best coming-of-age Spider-Man yeah, movie. Yeah, I, I was about to say, it is a coming-of-age story, and I, I love it. Uh, just Miles finding himself and finding uh, out, like, how he can be Spider-Man, how he can help others, and how he can be, how he can do that all and be himself. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I definitely agree. All right. Um, I guess that we are good for time. So, um, is there something that you want to plug right now? No, not really. I don't want people <laughs> on my social media. Um, you can play and plug your Spider-Man Twitter. <laughs> no, do not. No, no. Sergio is on Spider-Man Twitter. Though. Yes, I am. Don't don't go in there. Also, like if, I'll if, add him. If, no, don't, don't at me. This. Someone, someone in the Spider-Man Twitter will find this. They will hate it, and I don't want them knowing that they'll this is me. It. Film for thought, damn. No, they, right. they'll hate my takes, dude. <laughs> oh, your it's takes. Like oh. every, uh, the, there's, there's so many. Just all right. I'll... It's a war against Raimi, Raimi shills, uh, Mark Webb shills, and MCU stands. It's, 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 it's bad. It's bad. I can only imagine. The all one right. Thing, well. The one thing we can agree on is that the one thing that all of Spider-Man Twitter can agree on, and even then some people don't, is that Spider-Verse is the best. That's good. At yeah. least, you know, I mean, I there's definitely always going to be room for people debating. But um, yes, I, I do agree with that. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you for everybody that joined us on this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at the Film for Thought Show and on Twitter. And also, if you're listening to us on Spotify or any other um streaming services remember that we have a youtube page so uh yeah thank you so much for listening and i'll see you guys next time <laughs>